Okay, so what do you think about this movie? Uh, it's been a while since you saw it, huh? Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> a few weeks, maybe. Yeah, but here's the thing: like, I used to have this one. I think, I think this was still my second to last favorite one, and it still is. But it's so much better than the first one. Third to last, I think. Well, well, no, I guess it'd be second to last for you. For me, it was third yeah. to last because I put. Deathly Isles Part One is my last. That's right, and then yeah. Sorcerer's Stone, and then this yeah. one. But Chambers, when did this change? You think because Sorcerer's Stone used to be, even though it wasn't at the top of the list, I mean it'd be higher than Chamber, right? Yeah. So when do you think that changed, or why do you think that changed? And more and more uh, people are starting to like Chamber now. I like Chamber just because it's it's a lot more. There's a lot more different things in it, you know, just because it's. It's like like the first one, you know, it's kind of just the introduction, right? And then the second one, you really get into a lot more lore with Harry Potter. Yeah, I think it definitely the first movie is setting everything up. And then this movie is just like, uh, um, you know, now, now we can explore the lore behind it all. You've got characters introdu- uh, introduced and all that kind of stuff. So you can get into more of the <clears throat> more of the good stuff. Yeah. Um, Today we're talking about Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. This movie came out in 2002. Uh, it was directed by Chris Chris Columbus, again. <laughs> I almost said it again. Christopher. Yeah. Uh, again, the writers were J.K. Rowling as the source material. She wrote the novel, and Steve Close uh, wrote the sc- screenplay again. Um, we got Emma Watson back in the top cast this time. Yes. So that's pretty exciting, right? Yeah, absolutely. But I'm going to tell you what, who I'm not seeing in the top cast is Alan Rickman again. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm sure he's in the There's cast. There's be something to that. I don't know. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, he wasn't that crazy important in these first couple movies. Yeah. Starting in part three, he became important because then you get the background of him and Lupin and Sirius and James. And when you go further on, too, you tend to really find out, like, <clears throat> you kind of find out they do flashbacks in the later movies. You know what I mean? Flashbacks from him him and harry's interactions you know i won't go more into that but okay, like yeah. like you 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 get flashbacks from like episode from this episode from this movie the first movie the third movie you know throughout you know you really get a lot more of this flashbacks that harry that snape thinks of harry like from the first two movies yeah you know what i mean so it's it's kind of like yeah it's not important so much right now for where his character's at but it does come back to it and make it more important. I yeah, suppose. it may be more of like a Snape's trying to get a good handle on who Harry is now or whatever. Um, this movie stars Daniel Radcliffe again as Harry Potter, Rupert Grint as Ron Weasley, Emma Watson as Hermione Granger, Richard Harris returns as Albus Dumbledore. This will be the last time we see Richard Harris as Dumbledore. You know, Michael, I'm less of a fan. Michael Gammon comes in next, but uh, unfortunately, after this, after this. Um, ended uh richard harris was no longer dumbledore obviously because you know he passed away or whatever right but there's some uh there's some things behind the scenes with that that we have to talk about there's there's a lot of drama that is behind the scenes with this movie and these actors right. have you read about any of that Mm-mm. the drama i think no. you and i had talked about it uh with that has the, to do with Lockhart and the two Dumbledores and um, Ian McKellen and all this kind of stuff. Well, didn't... We'll yeah. get into it. It's okay. fine. Uh, Richard Griffiths returns as Uncle Vernon. Fiona Shaw, Fiona Shaw, excuse me, returns as Aunt Petunia. Harry Melling is again Dudley Dursley. This time... We have Toby Jones as the voice of Dobby. Now, I'd always, I knew this actor, and I knew who Dobby was, but I never, like, put the two together. Do you remember who Toby Jones is? I'm trying to look it up. <laughs> um, oh, who is he? So, he played the the right-hand man to the Red Skull in Captain America. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I do know that and now. He plays did, the voice of Dobby. I watched that behind-the-scenes yeah. Harry Potter thing that was on HBO or whatever. I did, too. This, that came over the, this yeah. past New Year's. yeah. Yeah, and like I'd always heard the name Toby Jones, but I guess I didn't realize that that was the actor who's Toby Jones. And when that came by, I'm like, that makes complete sense. Now I can see the voice. Yeah, you know who? Because I had always wondered who played the voice on that. But um, that's my son's favorite. That's Henry's favorite character is Dobby. 
And so this is a good. He loves this movie because it's a good introduction for Dobby. You know, it's it's kind of one of the main movies, like one of the only movies of the Harry Potter movies where there wasn't really a physical villain, if that makes sense. Like every other movie and every other book or whatever, there's not really a physical villain in this film. I got one. I know what you're saying, but yes, I agree with that. Alternatively, uh, part three, Prisoner of Azkaban, and we're going to spoil it for you if you haven't seen it, it doesn't have a villain. Well, it does in the sense of the Dementors. But they're not really villainous yet. Yeah, but throughout the movie, they are learning how to expel them, and we we know that they're villainous, and we know that they eventually become... But they're not after our main person, is what I'm saying. Yeah, but it's still kind of a physical villain. I guess. Right? I would say they're more of a nuisance right now, because obviously, you got Dumbledore around, he's not going to let, as you see, he sends Harry and everything like that. And there's the rat, but he's not doing anything for the plot. So the main plot of the movie is, one, there's a werewolf around. Around, and two, Sirius Black is around, and he's a, a, a bad guy, right? Yeah. And then you find out that maybe he's not really a bad guy. And mm-hmm. then you find out that the werewolf is someone who's close to us. So, I mean, then you're just like, okay, well, there's not really a villain. I mean, somebody gets exposed at the end of it, and the, there's the rat thing and everything, but there's really not... You kind of end it, you're like, oh, okay, there's just kind of like a huge misunderstanding, basically. <laughs> that's yeah, what that's what the end of three kind of yeah. culminates in, is just this huge misunderstanding. The one misunderstanding of Sirius Black and him get escaping because he saw the rat and all this kind of stuff. You it know? is my favorite film. It is a good film. And you get a lot more of Hermione in that film than you yeah. do with, where this one's a lot more, um, you know... The first one was both of them, right? Mm-hmm. The second one was probably more, more, I guess, Harry and, and Ginny kind of thing, you yeah. know? And then in the third one, definitely it's way more Hermione time than even Ron time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Ron's kind of off, and even in the next one, you get a little, a little bit more Ron in there than you do Hermione, you know? But it's, I actually, no, it probably goes back to more of a combination of the three and the fourth one. Yeah, and I'm trying to think... You know, the fifth one is truly the only one where they go into the um, they go into the climax together. Mm-hmm. Every other movie, they split apart by the end, and it's usually Harry taking on something alone. Fifth, the part five, I mean, kind of happens with that one too, but they stick with them the longest in part five. But mm-hmm. anyways, uh, we get introduced to some more um, Weasleys in this movie. Well, we get introduced to one more Weasley, and that's Mister Weasley, played by Mark Williams. Um, Such a good role. Great, great role and great, the perfect actor. Absolutely. He is so good as the kind, dopey, lovable Yeah, super powerful person, a uh, wizard. Of Ron you know? Weasley. Yeah. Well, yeah, and Mr. Weasley, I'm sure he's, he's never displayed anything crazy powerful in the book. Um, he works for... Um, the ministry. He works for the ministry, but it has to do with muggle affairs. So he's fascinated with regular humans. He thinks regular humans are the bee's knees. He thinks they're the greatest thing ever. He's, you know, always talking about, like, cars, and he's asking Harry, what is the exact purpose of a rubber duck? You know, different things like that. Like, like he's fascinated yeah. by it or whatever. Um, I just think he's, you know, pretty smart. I mean, we obviously know, you know, Mrs. Weasley's smart enough to uh, basically take down now she, you know, certain people. Yeah, she is. Yeah, she gets her moment to shine on. She does later on and everything. You so. don't realize how really actually powerful she is. No, she's very unassuming. You don't even see her pull out her wand until a yeah. certain later movie on yeah. in this this thing. But so we have Toby Jones as Dobby. Mark Williams is a new one for Mister Weasley. Uh, Bonnie Wright plays a, a little bit bigger of a role. We get to see more Jenny. In the last one, we only saw her introduced at the very beginning, but she didn't go to school with them, so you don't see her for the rest of the movie. But we get to see her in this one. Um, and uh, who plays Gilderoy, Gilderoy Lockhart? Oh, God, now I forgot his name. Oh. Toby Kenneth, Jones. no Kenneth Branagh. So Kenneth Branagh is a, is a very very popular actor, and he's a very popular director. This guy who played Gilderoy Lockhart, right? Yeah, he's directing all the. I think he's directing all the uh, Death on the Nile, Murder on the Orient, all those Agatha Christie novels that are being turned into now, right? He directed all of, uh, or he he stars as that um, that detective in there, and I think he's directed him, right? Yes, I can't yes. remember if he has or he's, not. He, well, he's a director, producer, and he's an actor, right? And he directed Thor, the very first Thor movie, 
And uh, oh, did he really? Yeah, and that's why I always thought he did such a good job because yeah, a lot of people give Thor crap, but that was almost an impossible movie oh, yeah. to bring into a superhero universe. You're bringing yeah. in old Norse gods, and even in the comics, it's a little awkward when Thor's around because you're like, this almost doesn't work, right? Well, and, and that's it, in the comics. And it's pretty crazy that when, especially when they bring in Hercules. Who literally is says, you know, he sits there and says, yes, my dad is Zeus, you know, and he's literal Hercules from the history books. Yeah. You know, it's like they do the same thing with Thor. Yeah. He's literally Thor from the history books. Not not a made and up Loki character. And I mean, Odin yeah, and these all are these all characters people. that have been around for thousands of years. And all all part of the mythology, right? The, yeah. um, uh, Midgard is another name for Earth. You know, you have uh, Mjolnir, which is the hammer. You have, uh, what's the little portal thing that they use to transport people? Uh, frostbite. <laughs> frostbite. Frostbite. Bifrost. <laughs> the Bifrost. So you have the Bifrost. And so you have all these that, that just... I don't know. It it's really it, it it just barely works in the comics, right? You still yeah. feel kind of a little weird when Thor's right. around because he's talking like yeah. you know, it was written back in the day and all that. So the fact that he did such a good job bringing I th- I I just think he did great. And now he's directing these new Agatha Christie um novels that are turning into movie. The first of which was Murder, Murder on the Orient Express and it had Johnny Depp and it had um Daisy Ridley and it had a bunch of other people. And then this new one with Gal Gadot, The Murder on the Nile. Right. Which I haven't seen yet, but I really want to see. He was in Tenant. Yeah. He's very prolific, oh, very yeah. good actor, and directed things that you wouldn't even expect. He was also in Avengers. He played one of the Asgardians. Makes sense, since he directed Thor. Yeah. So, oh, I remember him from Macbeth. That's where I remember him from. Gotcha. That's right. <clears throat> so. Yeah. Um. So, anyways, this this movie had to change it up a bit. It had to still play to kids, but we had to deal with a bit more grown up themes and stuff, right? Right. Instead of just one guy, just one one kid looking for a stone, and not many things happening, right? Mm-hmm. Not many things happen. They just know that there's a three headed dog, and they're looking for a stone. But what happens in this movie? They're looking for a snake in a pit, but they don't know it's a snake in the sewers. <laughs> They're looking for something that's actively yeah. doing something throughout the school yeah. year. Last school year, you know, you had the troll in the dungeon and all this kind of sneaky stuff, but nobody really knew that anything was going on. Only Harry, right. who was kind of attuned to the the stone that they got from the bank and the newspaper and all that, they knew that that's what was going on from that. But nothing, you know, real, it was relatively normal school year for the rest of the kids. Right. This one, you got attacks going all over. Uh-huh. So there's some kind of monster basically attacking uh, kids and animals and all kinds of stuff at school, and it should be killing them. But remember, we're still on movie two slash book two, so we can't have any actual real deaths and stakes and everything yet because we're still building. And we this find universe. out more so in this film than any other, you know, than the previous film. Like that what? Dumbledore has been planning all this. Oh yes, yes, continuously. Like even more so than the first one. The second one literally everything he's planning it yeah so we're going to continue with the the theme of uh dumbledore setting uh up all of this from the beginning so yeah um let me see what i had okay first i need to say this to people that we've gotten feedback on our first show from Mm -hmm. look nerds (laughs) the put outer as it's called in the first book, is, if anything, the same thing as what's later referred to as a deluminator. So we got some responses saying, you know, we had talked about the put-outer in the the, the uh, first book and first movie, right? Yeah. They're like, well, actually, that's the deluminator, and uh, it's not really. But if you go to the first book, chapter one, one of the first few pages, it's called a put outer. Now, maybe this is more descriptive of what it does, but if anything, this it, it's the same thing as what's later, like I said, what's later referred to as the deluminator. I subscribe to the theory that the put outer that's used in the first book, right? Okay. It's the prototype because okay. remember what he has to do, right? He has to click it for every light. Yes. Click, 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 click. But when he perfected it, because when it was a deluminator in the, the, the last book, it you just have to click once and it brings in all the light. 
You only have yeah. to click it once. So it only took one click to pull all the lights in the vicinity, and so he called it a deluminator, whereas the first one is called a put-outer. But go read Sor- Sor- Sorcerer's Stone, first chapter, it's called a put-outer. Huh. Yeah, don't at me. I mean, deluminator just sounds cooler, but put-outer just sounds like somebody uh, just couldn't think of the words. Put-outer sounds very J.K. Rowling and very much like a Dumbledore, Harry Potter world type of thing, because they call I things suppose. silly names like that all the time. Yeah. But. Um, so I guess we'd start out explaining uh, that th- the books in Pottermore do explain. Pottermore is a website that J.K. Rowling has, and it's something that she does to communicate with fans, but she also puts out additional information that wasn't in the books years later for people that have questions. Hey, whatever happened to this? Whatever happened to that? She's able to address a lot of that stuff. Uh, so we're, we're going for more of what was unsaid in the, in the, the movies and everything, so... Yeah, and um, see, there's no book or no writer or, or anything like that. You know, like you would never see Stephen King do that. You know what I'm saying? It's like there's nobody on the, you know, as far as writer goes that you can literally like, oh, this wasn't in the book. Can can you tell me what happened or what did this? No other artist would ever do that. Yeah. Ever. No, because they'd be like, I wrote the story. What's in the story is what I wanted out there. You guys can make it all up in your head. But I think J.K. Rowling is very like very particular about her world and her characters so she won't let (laughs) she won't let the audience be like well just whatever you think in your head she's like nope 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 this is how it is all information uh, about harry potter comes from me you can't make it up on your own this is how it is yeah i mean i think it's just the mind expanding thing you know what i mean it's it's like the world her worlds just never get smaller like they never stop growing yeah you know what i mean and doing it that way you know where you get other artists like you know lord of the rings you know yeah there's a lot of stuff on lord of the rings yeah yeah but you know say you get somebody like what maybe like the the line the witch in the wardrobe or something like that you know that's Mm -hmm. a love series but you can't go and ask the author i mean they're dead but yeah you you know what i'm saying like like that kind of thing you know uh it, it just you can't ask an artist, you know, if the, the the in a world they've built questions like that. I think a lot of the authors won't answer just because they say, "Look, I put all the information that I wanted to out there. It's on you to use your own imagination." Exactly, and that's what we do on this show is we try to use our own imagination to figure out what's what's behind this or what's behind that, or even if the movie says this or that, or maybe it's vague. We want to clear that up. Yeah. And so we, you know, we should have called this show our own headcanon or, or we should call it a headcanon or something because this is really what we think yeah. is going on in this world. But I think J.K. Rowling feels so attached and so passionate about her characters and her world that she's built that she wants to answer those questions. She won't leave it up to the reader because she's like, no, these are things that I want to be in control of, you know, the who's and, and what's and how's. Well, yeah. And, and then, you, but I mean, like, for instance, like, something that you don't happen with her world is you know like with star wars there's 15 yeah. uh, there's a thousand other uh writers that write for star wars that does get included to become canon yeah but it's like who decides this besides the person that created it well and that's the thing is that a lot of those uh legend books and eu or extended universe books all the storylines george lucas approved all of them so really? I mean like yeah they would come to him and be like hey this is what we want to do here's the idea and everything and he'd have to approve all of them or else it would be kind of just like a side story that's not really canon and some yeah. of those stories weren't canon yeah some of them were just kind of like what ifs or whatever but uh getting into this this is the sh- second shortest book with the first one being the shortest but it's the longest movie yeah. out of all of them that yeah. includes the deathly hallow movies mm-hmm. So this is what we were talking about. Like these first two movies, they kind of they could have probably been first, uh, been one movie because yeah. you were saying in the last episode that all of these should have been done two parters, yeah, at least for everything past the second yeah. book. Yeah. But there's there's it's the second shortest book, but it's the longest movie. So they were able to pull almost all that they could out of the book because it wasn't yeah. that long of a book. But there's still plenty of the that wasn't in the movie that's in the movie now, or that wasn't in the book. You know, vice versa. Um, so we'll go ahead. You know, one thing I got I got disappointed with with her writing was, or not her writing, but in the movies. Mm. And this is a little, getting a little ahead, but if I don't say it now, I'll forget it. Okay. Um, you know, they didn't really get into Hagrid's 
Hagrid's past. <laughs> like, like they, you know, in the book, you go to the village of the giants. You go to where the giants are. Yeah. The whole and you talk to the other giants. Right. You know, they they don't respect Hagrid, but you know yeah. they, you know, we talk to just these like guys. they don't respect his half brother that we're going to see. Yeah, if you grop. Yeah, if exactly. Stories, but yeah. You know, and and you know, you find out his dad was a uh, a crazy person, and his mom was. A giant. A giant, right. you know. But it, it, and she that, used to set him up on a little shelf. <laughs> I remember him telling yeah. that girl in Goblet of Fire. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I, like I said, you know, the the movie does get a lot into Hogwarts. This, this, or I mean, the book does. The movie does a little bit, and it gives Hagrid like the climax, climax um, sweet ending as yeah. well. Which is cool, but I mean, it kind of felt unjustified. Like at the end, it was like making a point, like the sweeping music and everybody clapping for Hagrid. You're kind of like, well, yeah, but I mean, you didn't really set that up. You know, mostly it was all about Tom Riddle and Ginny Weasley and everything, but there was a little flashback with Hagrid. But it was like everybody was cheering because Hagrid's name finally got cleared and, Mm -hmm. you know, he was shown to be a hero and an integral part of Hogwarts and everything. But it's like, yeah, but that was in the books, not, you didn't add any of that to the movies yeah. i was i still liked it because i still like everybody you know cheering for hagrid i think that's mm-hmm. one of the coolest things oh but. absolutely so spending the summer with the dursleys harry potter um is not very happy he hasn't heard from his friends he had, they haven't written him any letters and he's hardly able to get his owl out flying because they don't want him to communicate with anybody from school or whatever um one night uh harry meets a house elf that appears in his room named Dobby. Uh, Dobby warns him that it's dangerous to return to Hogwarts, and uh, he actually sabotages an important dinner that the Dursleys are having downstairs. Yeah, but I don't see how... That that would not prevent... I feel like that wouldn't prevent Harry... You know, Dobby doing all this wouldn't prevent Harry from not going to school. Like, they'd almost, like, want to get rid of him. No, but he's almost limited in what he can do, right? Because he's yeah. a house self, so he's under certain orders not to talk about certain things. Um, right. But how does he get away? You know, he's obviously, we could just state this out, right? You know, he's obviously, he's the Malfoy's house elf. Yeah. And so he's only able to get away for certain moments. And then he has to self punish himself for doing that because then he's betrayed his masters. Right. And everything. So, yeah, that's why he, like, obviously, like, he, all the time he's self flagellating and he has to hurt, he has to, like, put iron his hands and yeah. all kinds of just horrible things that probably were punishments he's gotten from the Malfoys right. that he's giving himself very very terrible thing in a kids movies yeah you know and they kind of just breeze over it real quick but um anyways they go to uh, ron's house and uh ron's mother flips out on him but then welcomes harry and it's like you know she's always happy to see harry and everything and then we get to see ron's dad he comes in he's working from the ministry he seems like a very aloof and just kind of fun loving mm-hmm. not caring about much type of guy Um, So they teach Harry to travel using the flu network, which for those of you in America, it just means chimneys, uh, you know, chimney, a chimney sweep, a a flu sweep or whatever. Um, But um, they they use this powder and they go into the fireplace and they have to throw it and say where they want to go. And uh, so Ron, Ron does one as an example first. And he says, Diagon Alley. And just like very specific about how he says that and for some reason i don't know harry has a seizure or something but he throws it down he's like diagonally and who would say diagon alley like that diagonally well and then he comes into a room diagonally i know it's so weird (laughs) like how did he know to put him there though i don't know but like why wouldn't it why it would have made sense if he said nocturnally but why would it put him in nocturnally but that could be another dobby thing or yeah. it could just be oh, Harry more, screwing more. up. Well, yeah, probably. Yeah. But so, anyways, they get there. Harry kind of has to. He he for some reason comes out in Diagon Alley, and it's real creepy. And but uh, Hagrid grabs him and kind of brings him out to the the uh, to 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 Diagon Alley, so he can meet uh, meet up with the Weasley family and Hermione's there and all that. So they're going to a book bookstore, and this is where they're introduced to Gilderoy Lockhart. And, uh, you know, he's got all these books out. He's a very famous one. And he's a very fa- famous wizard and everything like that. Do we find out now that he's he's going to be the defense against the Dark Arts? Mm, I think so. I can't remember. 
I can't remember either. I think so because I think he says something about it, like that he's you know Harry's going there too. Yeah. yeah. So um, Hugh Grant was actually supposed to play Lockhart. Mm-hmm. Um, I could see that. And and Hugh Grant's middle name is Mungo. And if you know anything about Harry Potter, is that the mental institution in the Harry Potter world is basically uh, that's basically what it is. It's called uh, Saint Mungo's Hospital for mm-hmm. Magical Maladies or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of funny because after this movie, Lockhart ends up going to Saint Mungo's, and you know Hugh Grant's middle name was Mungo. Mm-hmm. I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, um, they while there they they meet Gilderoy. They see that he's a very he's very a guy that you know is worried about his fame and his popularity, and he's very vain and all that. Um, and he wants people to take pictures of him. You know, he loves doing that. All the women love him, right? You mm-hmm. know, especially Molly Weasley. The way she's like, I'll get all your books signed, but she's mm-hmm. so happy to be in line. Except for Hermione, Her- Hermione at first was like that, but then after a while, you can yeah. tell she. She was like, okay, she she could call his BS. Like, she could tell he was full of BS. Yeah, in the bookstore, she liked him. And then when he came out for that first class, her and all the girls are like, oh. But then when he couldn't even, yeah. you know, handle the pixies, yeah. and she had to do it. I yeah. think after then, she's kind of like, okay, well, this guy, yeah. he didn't do much. She always rolls his eyes, her eyes after that. Yeah. So... Now, why do we think uh, we find out that that Gilderoy Lockhart's actually been hired to be a Defense Against the Dark Art teacher? Mm-hmm. So, why do you think that? Knowing, I mean, because Dumbledore obviously knows probably that Lockhart is kind of a fraud, right? He would have to. It'd have to be the only person that knew, like that that wasn't you know taken back by his uh, mystical charms. Yeah. So, why do you think that he hired him? Uh, kind of. One or two reasons, like either because Snape, he didn't want Snape to be the Defense Against Dark Arts right. teacher. We find out that out, that he wants to keep him in potions and things like that, you know. And maybe Snape knows why. Maybe Dumbledore's like, hey, by the way, Voldemort kind of cursed this position, so yeah. let's not have you go into it or you might die. Yeah, and I think maybe just to call out his BS. Yeah, because Snape, if you find out reading the books that Snape had always been wanting, he applied like a thousand times, but he always wanted to be the Defense of Against course, Dark yeah. Arts teacher. They say in the first movie, yeah. Yeah. everybody knows it's the dark uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts that he wants, yeah. or that he fancies, or yeah. whatever. But. but I mean, he continuously wants that position, and Dumbledore d- never puts him in that position, you know, I mean, until after he dies. But um, <laughs> No, it, I think he just did it, for one, to call out his BS, for two, that... Obviously, maybe he was somewhat defensive and good at defense against curses in a way. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, like the guy seems to just kind of get by life uh, being famous, but not really having proof of doing any right. of these things. And that's because he really actually just sucks at every type of magic. Yeah. There's one thing that he's very good at, and that's memory charms. Yeah. He, he knows how to erase people's memory, and he does that very well. And so what he does is he'll go along with people that actually do these amazing things, and then when it's done, he'll erase their memory and then tell everybody that he did it and give somebody else a memory that he did it. Yeah. And so then he gets the credit for it. But Dumbledore knows this, you know, and yeah. I'm sure Snape knows it too because Snape is one of the best um, um, legilimens or aquamens. I have to get back into that. But um, I think the Dumbledore hired Lockhart because, first of all, he wanted Harry to see what arrogance looked like in its most, like, base and gross form, mm-hmm. you know? Because Harry, being who he is and, and knowing what he's going to go through and, you know, Dumbledore knowing that he's probably going to have a lot of power and everything, he could have the chance to fall into some arrogance. And that's what yeah. Dumbledore, that's what Voldemort got into is he mm-hmm. got very arrogant about his power. Um, so I think that, you know, he hired him because he wanted Harry to see what arrogance looked like in its most base and gross form, because that's, I mean, this is just a terrible character, and, and you wouldn't want Harry to end up like this. But, you know, his his father was popular and arrogant as well. James was. You know, yeah. he, 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 got, he got a real sense of how good he was at magic, and everybody loved James because he was really good at magic, and he was really likable and all that. So he became popular, and it's kind of turned him into a bully. And he didn't want that to happen to Harry. He didn't want what happened to Voldemort to happen to Harry. He was trying to keep Harry on a good track. So I think, you know, his father was popular and arrogant. 
uh, and that probably would have continued down that road if it wasn't for the change he made in school after Snape almost died, which we'll get into the next one in the next movie. But uh, Harry needed that change as well, or else he might end up like Voldemort. You know, we you just didn't want him to get too far into his arrogance and everything. So I think he wanted him to see Gilderoy Lockhart for that purpose, to see this is what you can become if you are too proud of your power, you know. Yeah. Seeing that and seeing what Voldemort went through in this movie as Tom Riddle, you know. Yeah. It kind of helped both. But anyways, the kids meet, uh, the kids see Draco and then they meet Draco's father, played amazingly by Jason yeah. Isaacs. Exactly. Can you ma- can you imagine no. anybody but Jason Isaacs playing nope. Lucius? Nope. No, I, I honestly can't. I, I just, he just plays it so perfectly. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's funny because he has a fall from grace, like starting in this film, like from this film Lucius on. Does yeah, yeah. He just has a fall from grace starting in this film. Like as soon as he meets Harry Potter, he it just everything starts going downhill for him. Yeah, you know, loses his elf, you know, all that other stuff. That's true. Yeah, I didn't even think about that, that losing Dobby was really the first thing. Mm-hmm. You know, like he, and he, he already being blames caught Harry. out by Dumbledore. Yeah, and he uh, already blames Harry saying? for them losing Voldemort, right? Mm-hmm. So Voldemort was taken from him. Now his house elf, mm-hmm. and soon his house and his reputation yep. and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so anyways, they kind of an interesting little scene where he's talking down to the Weasleys because they're obviously pure blood like the Malfoys are, but they're poor, yeah. you know, because they, they haven't put as much stock into their status yep. over the years as the Malfoys has. And that's another thing that confirms to Harry that, you know, he made a good choice in, in friends and all mm-hmm. that. Um, interestingly enough, he, as he's talking down to him, he pulls the books out of Ginny's little cauldron thing. It's like, oh, these tattered books and everything, but they just bought them from the store. I guess they were secondhand books or something, yeah, but probably. when he puts them back in the cauldron, it looks a little thicker than it was yeah. when he took it out. So, um, uh, anyways, uh, Harry and Ron they all they all go to King's Cross Station, and uh, Harry and Ron can't get into um, platform nine and three quarters, and mm. this is because of also again uh, because uh, Dobby. So yeah, Dobby stopped them from getting through the uh, the the platform. Which I don't know why do they get in the car and go. Because they had to get to school. I mean, I guess. <laughs> but I mean, Jen and or uh, uh, Mister and Missus Weasley weren't going to get on the train with the kids. They were as soon as they got them on the train, they were going to come back out and get in the Good car point. and go home. Right. Good point. So, I'd be like, well, why don't you just go wait by the car? Oh, then I think that's what they said. Let's go wait by the car. And then Ron goes, the car. And then they start driving. It's like, why would you not just wait a few minutes? Like, yeah, you won't get to ride the the, the train, and that sucks. But at least you can get in the car with actual witches and wizards that are supposed to be using that, that can turn it invisible and everything, and um, you know get a you ride. You know they to didn't all travel, and the, what they they probably I don't know why the car was there, and then yeah. I'm sure it's I I, I think I've only read Chamber of Secrets one time, and so I don't remember. But it's it's one of those things where. <laughs> Where, like, okay, first of all, how did the car get there? Unless they all went there and then Mr. Weasley just met them there with the car because he's the one that really likes to drive the car because wizards don't have cars, right? You know, they travel by different means and stuff, but he just thinks it's fun to drive in a car. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't know. It's just one of those probably Rachel moments where we have to just be like, okay, well, that was Ron and, and, and Harry being stupid. And if Hermione was there... She might say, well, why don't we just wait for your parents to get back and just get a ride from to yeah. school from them? And uh, then at that point, you're just like, well, why don't you just use the flu network? But we know that you can't get into Hogwarts that way. But Yeah, you just go to Alberforce. Yeah, so you just go to Hogsmeade. It's, it's very weird. This whole, like, it seems like a contrivance on how, unless, like, like in the books, like, Dobby made. And they do say in the, the movie, what if our parent, what if mom and dad can't get back? So he's thinking maybe this is locked forever and they're trapped there. But I think I'd wait a little bit at least, right? Give it an hour or two, and if yeah. they're not back by then, okay, yeah, they're trapped there. Now what do we do? Mm-hmm. You know, and even then, well, I don't maybe know. Maybe their parents couldn't come back. Maybe Ron's parents couldn't come back either. That's what that's you, what they you said. Kind of find out, you kind of find out that, you know, uh, uh, elves are more powerful than than. It's a different type of magic. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say that they're more powerful, but they they have a lot of different types of magic. Yeah, but the, you take you take away the the uh, the 
magician or not magician the wizard or witches you take away their wand they're nothing for the most part mm-hmm. maybe they got a little bit of something but will probably be all right well yeah but what i'm saying is they're nothing and then but house elves don't need wands yeah so that's what i'm saying i mean they even mentioned hey you know what if mom and dad can't get back or whatever but i just think it's a weird contrivance of of, of how having them take a flying car but they take the flying car, they they come into the school, they break a tree, the Whomping Willow, they crash into the Whomping Willow, which the Whomping Willow becomes important in other movies going forward, yeah. but just remember it for now. But it beats the crap out of the car. They get in trouble from Snape. Filch brings them to Snape's office, and he's like, look at this newspaper. You were you know, seen by like no less than like five or six or seven muggles or whatever. So, I mean, they're like, you almost, you know, you're exposing us to the normal world and everything. So, they, they thought they were going to get expelled, but obviously they didn't get expelled, but they yeah. did get detention. So, um, they go to detention, or, you know, they, they, they go about their business. They're in Hogwarts now, right? Harry has to do detention with um, with Mr. Or with Gilderoy Lockhart. Yeah. And uh, I think that's after last year, maybe Dumbledore and McGonagall figured, okay, he can't get in trouble if he's helping this guy just sign autographs. (laughs) So let's just give Harry to this harmless guy signing autographs. He'll be good. But of course, it never is with Harry Potter. You know, during the detention, he starts hearing strange voices. And and I think Kenneth Branagh kind of like, oh, really? And he's like kind of like looking around like, "Uh, what is he hearing? you You get a sense where you don't know if he's more freaked out by maybe voices yeah. that Harry's hearing yeah. or the fact that Harry's hearing voices that yeah. nobody else can really hear. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so anyways, uh, he, he leaves the leaves the detention. He's like, oh, I better go eat, you know, because people at the Great Hall are finishing up dinner and Harry hasn't had dinner yet. So he finds uh, uh, the caretaker, Mr. Filch, or Argus Filch's cat, Miss Norris, uh, petrified and hanging up on this um, I don't know, a lantern deal or yeah. whatever. Um, but besides, uh, or beside the body is a message written in blood saying, The Chamber of Secrets has been opened. Enemies of the air, beware. It's written in blood. As he comes, uh, as he's looking at that, all these other students come around and find Harry with this body. Mm-hmm. Um, what happens first is that he runs into Ron and Hermione and they're like, hey, you, were at, well, you weren't at dinner. What were you doing? He's like, well, I was in attention, but I... St- do you guys hear these voices? And they're like, uh, what voices? And so he's like, I'm hearing voices. It's saying kill, kill, something like that. And that's when they find that body. And, you know, they're trying to explain how they found it. And they're like, well, we found it just before when Harry was saying that he heard. And that's when they all kind of look at Harry and they all shut up because then they're like, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't tell people that Harry's hearing voices. Yeah. It's probably not the best thing. Um, later in a class, uh, they uh, asked Professor McGonagall, what is the Chamber of Secrets? Well, you all know, of course, that Hogwarts was founded over a thousand years ago by the four greatest witches and wizards of the age. Godric Gryffindor, Helga Hufflepuff, Rowena Ravenclaw, and Salazar Slytherin. Now, three of the founders coexisted quite harmoniously. One did not. Three guesses who? Now, according to legend, Slytherin had built a hidden chamber in this castle known as the Chamber of Secrets. Well, shortly before departing, he sealed it until that time when his own true heir returned to the school. The heir alone would be able to open the chamber and unleash the horror within and by so doing purge the school of all those who in Slytherin's view were unworthy to study magic. Muggleborns. Well, naturally the school has been searched many times. No such chamber has been found. Professor? What exactly does legend tell us lies within the chamber? Well, the chamber is said to be home to something that only the heir of Slytherin can control. It is said to be the home of a monster. Now, I think the other, I think the other 
founders had their own chain, secret chambers or whatever. I don't know if they've ever been found, but I know there's been talk that the other founders have their 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 secret chambers or whatever. But this one supposedly was opened back when decades ago. We won't even see when, but you know, decades ago, this was supposedly opened, and um, only the heir of Slytherin can do it. <clears throat> So um, this monster uh, is capable of purging the school of Muggleborn. So this monster only goes after the Muggleborn and not pure blood. Because remember, Salazar Slytherin was very pure blood mania type of person. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously they suspect it must be Malfoy, right? Because even Malfoy made a little joke and be like, you know, watch out, you mudbloods will be next and everything. And you think, okay, well, his father went through school. So they figured because they know it's been open before and that somebody's been killed before, um, that it's uh, that, that somebody had to have gone through it, and they figured uh, it was Lucius that did it before, and then he taught he taught Draco how to do it. Yeah. So um, that's that's kind of the the explanation they throw out. But uh, Harry's going to start getting a little bit more information um, that it might be a little different. So. Yeah, and you end up finding the reason it's opening is not the reason you think it is. Like, you know, when I was reading the book or whatever, it took me a minute to actually figure out. I was like, wait, no. Oh, okay. But that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, okay, whatever. Like in which part? Like who's really opening it and everything else oh, like yeah. that, you know? Yeah. It's a little weird, but... Just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. Um, there, There's the... Because of this, they wanted to start teaching the, the kids some defensive spells. Yeah. So if they have to come upon some kind of a monster they can defend themselves pixies or whatever <laughs> so they had like a little a little sparring class where they put Malfoy and Harry against each other and uh, Malfoy gets a, a snake thrown out there and you know he doesn't know how to get rid of it or whatever and you know Lockhart tries to and fails and then Snape's like oh I'll, I'll figure it out and everything well then suddenly Harry starts speaking to the snake which we've seen like in the last movie but in the last movie, he was speaking English. In this movie, he's like, Parcel tongue was actually a real language, and it was invented by the linguistics uh, department at Cambridge University. So they actually invented the language of parcel tongue and taught it to Daniel Radcliffe to speak in Harry mm-hmm. Potter. And I think it's spoken like that throughout the other movies whenever mm-hmm. parcel tongue is spoken, which is usually by Voldemort or Harry. Yeah. And one time by Ron, interestingly enough. Yeah. He talks in his sleep. Well, not only that, yeah, he talks in his, uh, Harry talks in his sleep and everything. Um, so they suspect that Malfoy is a hare, so they're like, okay, well, what we need to do is we need to... But after he starts speaking parcel tongue, that one... He was trying to tell the snake to leave the one kid alone, but it was like going after that kid. And so everybody thought that, that one, Harry can speak parcel tongue, which is true. And two, that he was telling the snake to attack the boy, which isn't true. He was trying to tell him to stop. And, but even Snape is kind of like... Oh, does somebody ever ask JK that... You know, after Deathly Hollows, whatever, you know, near the end, could Harry still speak Parcel Tongue? Um, that would be interesting. I think it has been asked on Pottermore. I think that she said something like he's he's got a little bit in it, but he really can't speak to him anymore. Gotcha. <clears throat> really, the only the heir of Slytherin can do that, and that part of him was destroyed. So I want to, I'll, fi- I'll find that out by next episode. But I want to say that no, I don't think he could speak it much. I think he maybe knew a couple phrases, but like he couldn't really speak it after that. So, um, so anyways, they're like they figure, okay, well we gotta we gotta find out what's going on, and but to do that we gotta make uh, Polyjuice potion and uh, become Crab and Goyle, so we so Malfoy will like speak to us freely and admit if he opened it or not. Uh, one thing that the one thing that Draco does tell him is that um, a Muggle-born girl died when the chamber was last opened. So there was a girl who died when it was last opened, and we find out who that girl is. Yeah, Harry actually finds one one day he finds uh, that diary. He finds the diary in the toilet. Was it on the yeah. toilet or on the ground? Maybe it was uh, on the ground. Yeah. Or whatever. But. Um, you find this diary and it's it's a diary of 
Tom Riddle, this kid named Tom Riddle. So he doesn't really know what this is about, but Mm -hmm. um, he starts kind of trying to write in the diary. And he actually finds that the diary actually communicates back with him when he's like, who are you? And it's like, I'm Tom Riddle. And so like whatever, whoever owned this diary somehow got part of themselves in this diary so they can answer questions in the future Mm -hmm. or whatever, right? So as he's writing in this diary and communicating, it says, let me show you. And it flashes, does a flashback. It brings Harry into a memory somehow. So he finds out that there was a girl that died, and this was when Dumbledore was still a teacher there. I don't think he was headmaster yet, but he might have just been a teacher there. But he, uh, you see a flashback of Tom Riddle looking to seeing this dead body being brought out, and he asks Dumbledore, is the school going to be closed? And Dumbledore is like, yeah, probably. And this kid, and remember, this was like years and years in the past, and the kid's like, you know, I don't want school to be closed. So he goes straight to this room, and guess who's in this room? Guess who's a student there as well when this Tom Riddle person is there? Hagrid. Hagrid. So he walks in, and we see this shorter but still very large Hagrid. And this kid, Tom Riddle, tells Hagrid, and is like, hey, um, I know it was you. I know it was your spider. And uh, you need to give it up um, because, all you know, there's a girl that's been killed. Everybody's going to have to go home if you don't admit what you did, admit what your your monster did. And Hagrid's trying to tell him, no, it wasn't Aragog. He called this spider Aragog. And it was this giant spider that, that uh, Hagrid kept in this case. And Tom Riddle tried to take it out, but it scurried off and left. So we find out that Tom Riddle showed Harry that it's been opened and it was perhaps opened by Hagrid, uh, who had this this monster, this spider. But we know that it's not a spider, right? Mm-hmm. We know that obviously there's there's more to it than that. So um, he goes through and that's when Harry finds out that that that's why ha- Hagrid got kicked out of Hogwarts. That's why he got his wand taken away, supposedly. Yeah. I think Dumbledore let him hide it in his umbrella or whatever. Yeah. But um, but that's what you figure out. And you assume that Dumbledore, because when Dumbledore's talking to Tom Riddle and Tom Riddle's like, hey, is the school going to be closed down or whatever? And Dumbledore's like, yeah, you can kind of see that Dumbledore's looking at Tom Riddle like he suspects him of something, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. you get a, you get kind of the inkling that Dumbledore doesn't trust this Tom Riddle guy. And we know that he trusts Hagrid. Yeah. So um, he even asks Tom Riddle, he says, is there something you want to tell me about? And he goes, no, no, I'm good. And then Dumbledore's like, all right, well, yeah, off to bed then or whatever. Yeah. And he ends up asking Harry that same question later on in the movie when Harry's really starting to look guilty for opening the chamber and everything. And Dumbledore's like, of course, I don't believe that. And he's like, but is there something you want to tell me? And I think that was like kind of another test because we know that he asked Tom Riddle that one time. And now Harry's giving him the exact same answer that Tom Riddle gave him. So that's probably making Dumbledore a little nervous, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Is there something you wish to tell me? No, sir. Nothing. Very well, then. Off you go. Riddle! Come. Professor Dumbledore. It is not wise to be wandering around this late hour, Tom. Yes, Professor. I I suppose I... I had to see for myself if the rumors were true. I'm afraid they are, Tom. They are true. About the school as well? I don't have a home to go to. They wouldn't really close Hogwarts, would they, Professor? I understand, Tom. But I'm afraid that Master Dippet may have no choice. Sir, if it all stopped, if the person responsible was caught... Is there something... You wish to tell me? No, sir. Nothing. Very well, then. Off you go. Good night, sir. Um, so anyways, uh, the, so the diary is stolen from Harry again. Um, Hermione then gets petrified, and so does this other kid, uh, Neville, the one with the camera, who's been obsessed with Harry and wanted a... a is it uh, Neville? Not Neville. Um, Colin. Colin. So Colin. Um, <laughs> remember Love Actually? Yes. Hello, I'm Colin. <laughs> so Colin, um, who's been obsessed with Harry, you know, taking his picture, always asks for his autograph. Mm. And I just want to jump forward with this because I know I'll forget it. Yeah. Um, 
So in the Battle of Hogwarts that happens at the very end, we won't get too much into what happens, but basically anybody who wasn't in their last year of Hogwarts, the seventh year, um, had to leave. They weren't allowed to fight in the in the battle because they were considered underage. 17 is when you're considered of age, whereas here in America it's like 18. There it's 17. So seventh year students were allowed to stay and make their own decision if they wanted to fight, but everybody younger than that had to go. Yeah. So they took everybody out through the dungeons and into Aberforth and all that. Mm-hmm. But Colin and a couple others actually snuck back because Colin was younger than yeah. that. But him and a couple others actually snuck back because they wanted to fight for Harry. Mm-hmm. And they felt that closeness for Harry. And uh, unfortunately, Colin ended up losing his life in that uh, Battle of Hogwarts. Yeah. Um, and uh, and there's something sweet that uh, certain characters will go to Colin's grave and give autographs every year and leave that at his grave for him because yeah. it's something that he had always wanted. But. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyways, we get to, um, the, like I said, the diary is stolen, Hermione is petrified, Colin's petrified, Harry and Ron go to Hagrid and is like, hey, what's this? And he's like, no, 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 it, it's not, it wasn't the spider, it wasn't me, you got this all mixed up. Um, but as they're trying to talk to Hagrid about it, uh, Dumbledore, Mr. Magic, uh, Cornelius Fudge, all uh, both arrive at the uh, at Hagrid's hut and said, sorry, we have to take you into custody. Basically saying, we're taking you to Azkaban until we can get this figured out. Because remember, as everybody knows, he's the one that did it last time. Yeah. And that's what he got his wand taken away right. from. Right. And so they think that he's doing it again, so mm-hmm. they have to take him into custody. Now, Dumbledore's there, and he knows that this has to be done. He, there's nothing he can do to change the ministry's mind or whatever, but he's trying to be there in support. While he's doing that, Malfoy shows up as well, Lucius Malfoy, the the elder Malfoy, and um, he arrives to tell that, that he's convinced, and we find out later he more threatened the other governors that if yeah. they didn't vote with him to remove Dumbledore as headmaster, mm-hmm. then he would curse their families and do all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But we find out that it's been voted that that. Dumbledore needs to be removed from Hogwarts. And it's not going to be the first time mm-hmm. in the series that that happens. He's actually removed another time and then another time. But yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. but anyways, uh, he, uh, he gets removed because they think he's not dealing with the situation very well, that he puts too much trust in Hagrid, and everybody thinks that Hagrid's done it. Now, Malfoy actually knows what's happening. Um, because he kind of initiated this whole thing, but he's, you know, he's working his little scheme or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but they're under the invisibility cloak, and uh, and Dumbledore basically says to nothing, to but he looks right at where they're standing, and nobody else can see what he's looking at, and he says, help will be given at Hogwarts whenever it's asked for. Something like that, something close to that. Yeah. And uh, for those who asked for it, and remember, he asked, he asked, he gave Harry the the opportunity to ask him for help mm-hmm. early in the movie. Yeah. So, um, and then right before they leave, Dumbledore says, like, or I mean, Hagrid goes, "Well, if anybody wanted to figure out what was happening, all they'd have to do is follow, follow the, the spiders. spiders. Yep, that'd lead them right." And he's like, "Oh yeah," and somebody else will have to fang, uh, feed Fang while I'm gone. So he's a very like he knows he's going to ask him, man, which is like the worst thing you could go to. But he doesn't seem scared to go. Not too much. Like Hagrid's not a very brave, brave person. No, because but none of them have wa- wands at Azkaban. He literally is probably physically the strongest person at Azkaban. Yeah, but so it's, it's probably like a cakewalk for him. But it's just the Dementors. But, okay, take know? away the Dementors. It's not like you know. It's like putting a a um, a lion in a cage of of deer or something like that. You know, in in. I guess, but the only guards at Azkaban are the Dementors, so that's really what he has to deal with. I'm sure it's not that fun, but... No. Anyways, he gets arrested and taken to Azkaban because they think he did it, and so they tell him to follow the spiders, which Harry's like, okay, this has got to be the answer because I saw that memory. They go into the monster, and I don't know why... This whole scene never made sense to me either because if Hagrid knew Aragog, he would know that Aragog would want to kill anybody but Hagrid. And eat yeah. them and everything. And so why would he send them into in there? I mean, Aragog gives us a little exposition and kind of tells us a few things that happen, but it really doesn't get him that much closer, and it actually just puts them in danger. Yes. So because I mean, he told them all that stuff, thinking that there's no way they're going to get away. Yeah. So it's like, why would Hagrid send them? Up I like don't know. That? Hagrid had a good, but we know that Hagrid's not very not the most responsible. No. I would I half expected Dumbledore to put his head back in and be like. 
Ignore that. Don't listen to what Haggard just said. If anybody is listening, ignore that. <laughs> but, you know, he just lets them go. So, And all Aragog does was, like, he's like, no, Haggard's innocent. He didn't do it. Um, the monster that actually is in the chamber is our mortal enemy. A spider mortal enemy. Yeah. So um, when they go back to see Hermione, they see that she's holding something in her hand. And she they, they take the paper out. And they're like, oh, okay, a basilisk. So yeah. this has been the mortal enemy is a basilisk. She figured it out that it that's yeah. actually what's down there, a basilisk. And it, it's not just a normal snake. It it kills people who make direct eye contact with yeah. it. Uh, but the petrified people only saw it indirectly. So mm-hmm. um, Miss Norris, there was water on the floor. Remember, the bathroom was flooded. So Miss Norris, the cat, only saw the snake in the reflection, and it right. got petrified. I don't know how it got hung up on that thing, but... Um, uh, the kid who was almost attacked by the snake, he saw it through nearly headless Nick, which made her nearly headless Nick, you know, kind of go off for a little bit, but that's how he got petrified. Um, Colin took a picture with his camera, took a picture with his camera. So he didn't see it directly. And Hermione was using mirrors to look around because she had figured it out before everybody else. The only person to figure it out. Meaning she probably even figured it out before the teachers or right, whatever. Right, but, right. Um, she's using mirrors so that she, but then she ends up getting petrified anyways. Um, but then again, you never know. Dumbledore might have known this the entire time. Right. Exactly. Yeah, he, he might've been to the point where like through every single one of these books and series, it was like, you know what? I'm just going to be at the weight. I know what everything's going to happen. I know how I'm molding this myself. If it gets too hairy, I'll probably jump in, you it know, gets too hairy. literally. Yeah, but I mean, I think he's probably also shielding Harry from all the outside influences. Like, look, let's we got to build Harry up. We, he's got to fight soon. He's got to learn how to fight. You know, so that's yep. a big part of it. So, <clears throat> well, I, I think the whole movie was written, like you said, with, uh, you know, teaching Harry some things, right? And I think a big part of this movie, not the, the main reason, but, you know, a big part of it was just, you know, the sword of Gryffindor, you know, bringing that... Because he talks about it later on, you yeah. know, and he talks about how, how remember Harry, when I told you, well, George Harrison told you that, uh, you know, you can get help when, whenever needed, you George know, Harrison, <laughs> well, I remember from the Beatles, not, not George Harrison, but, uh, what's his face? <laughs> the original Dumbledore, uh, Richard Harris, Richard Harris. There yeah. we go. I don't know where it <laughs> Richard Harris. Um, you know, I, I, th- I feel like that was a big part of it you know you had to say hey this is the sword of gryffindor it becomes available when people need it and you know only for you know gryffindor people yeah you know because because you know that that chamber was for slytherin in a way you know what i mean it's like their their culture you know and trying to show you a little bit of history of gryffindor with the sword you know yeah yeah, I think it's, I mean, because what you're talking about is there was an earlier scene where they go into Dumbledore's office when, you know, everybody thinks that Harry's guilty, but Dumbledore's like, dude, I know you're not guilty yeah. yet. But before he came Even up... Even McGonagall knows he's not guilty. Yeah, right. But before he before Dumbledore kind of came into his office, he, uh, f- first of all, Harry was talking to the hat, and he was like, you know, did you put me in the right house? And the hat's like, basically like, look... If I would have had it my way, you would have been in Slytherin. Yeah. <clears throat> but I think that's part of that Voldemort that he's feeling or whatever. So, um, but also he sees the phoenix in there. And, you know, Richard Harris, the guy who played Dumbledore, he actually thought the bird was real. He oh, wow. actually said to them, he said, it's amazing how they train these things. And they're like, um, it's not real. And he's like, what did he say? Um he said something like, oh, F you, or something like very un Dumbledore like, or whatever. But he was just like, he was shocked at that it wasn't a real bird and everything. But yeah, we get the, we get a little monologue, or we get a little um, uh, exposition that from Dumbledore that the bird is a phoenix and they burst into flames and then they're reborn from the ashes. So they never really die. Yeah. We find out like later on. I wonder if that's the same bird in, in the uh, Fantastic Beasts. Uh, it could be because they're very rare. Because where did he get the... Remember, doesn't he say where he gets the bird from? This could have been where he got the bird from because, remember, um, in the Fantastic Beasts when Dumbledore was younger or whatever, he was like, you know, I've always wanted one. You know, yeah. it'd, be, it'd be nice to have one or something like that. Yeah. And then, but he does His say how... has one. It does say how that, like, it'll... Um, Phoenixes will always come to a Dumbledore in need or something like that. Yeah. You know, so... 
I guess Harry's kind of pretty. I guess cool. Harry's a Dumbledore because <laughs> it came to him when he was a knee. Or, or Dumbledore was planning the whole thing, entire thing. Yeah, well, I mean, they come to they come to Dumbledore's, but they also come to true some people that are are loyal to Dumbledore yeah. as well, and people that are dying too, apparently. Apparently, so um, anyways, after they're done with the the spiders and everything, um, they find out that basically. Ginny's been taken into the chamber, and they find out that Lockhart, Lockhart's supposed to be the one to go after him, uh, to, to, to go into the chamber and to go get Ginny. Right. So they go to his office, and they find him packing up. Um, and, of course, he's scaredy cat Lockhart, yeah. uh, and uh, obviously um, Kenneth Branagh plays him amazingly. Yeah. One thing I wanted to say um, about <laughs> about Kenneth Branagh, uh, who plays Gilda, Gilderoy Lockhart, um, Richard Harris said that him and Ian McKellen were technically brilliant, but passionless performers. He did not like Richard Harris, the guy who played Dumbledore. Yeah, he didn't like Richard. Uh, he didn't like uh, Kenneth Branagh, and he didn't like Ian McKellen. And basically huh. said that they're passionless performers. You know, it's just like real kind of Mean Girls type stuff. Wow. And uh, you know, I guess complimented by saying they're technically brilliant, but passionless performers. Saying you know they're technically they're hitting all their their lines. Richard Harris is kind that, of a but, jerk, huh? So, I mean, that's what I'm saying is that he said these things, and when he passed away, they actually asked Ian McKellen, who would go on to play the other said, most famous. Michael G- he said, they said they, instead of playing the other most famous white wizard, uh, Gandalf, which he eventually went on to do with Lord yeah. of the Rings, they asked him to play Dumbledore. And Ian McKellen he turned, uh, he said, out of respect of his view on me, I'm going to turn the role of Dumbledore down. Because he knew that Richard Harris didn't like him, and so he's like, I don't want to take his role because he didn't like me and didn't think I was a very good performer. So he's like, I think it would be disrespectful if I took that role that he did so brilliantly with. So Ian McKellen's like, like complimenting this guy and being respectful. And Richard Harris. And he's a genius, too. Ian McKellen, I mean, they don't call him Sir Ian McKellen for nothing. No, and he would have been good with the soft-spoken thing and then the warrior coming out. Yeah. He would have played both of those parts. Yeah. That You know, you had to Mike, Michael Gambon playing one warrior, part. Warrior, yeah. That's maddening. Yeah. And then you got Richard Harris playing the... Soft. You know, the, oh, oh, yeah. It's a <laughs> Yeah. You know, so... But I just thought that was pretty interesting that Richard Harris, you know, he... Uh, <laughs> you yeah. know, aired out some dirty laundry there. And then, uh, like I said, Ian McKellen was tapped to play, to take over the role. And he's like, no, uh, Richard Harris didn't like me, so I, I wouldn't feel right taking that role. Yeah. And then he ended up going to become maybe an even more powerful wizard in Gandalf. So, yeah. Um, also, Emma Thompson. And Magneto. That's true. Magneto as well. Uh, do you know Emma Thompson? Yes. Uh, I don't know personally, but right. I've, I've seen her work. Uh, she's not in this movie. Kenneth Branagh was in Harry Potter first, but then she came in later as Professor Trelawney. Um, crazy Coke bottle glasses. Yeah, and people don't realize if you, unless you read the book, how important, how important of a is. character she yeah. is. And she doesn't you, even know it. It does not. And it's, an, it's probably one of the other things that bothered me the most with the interpretation of, of the books into movies yeah. is she was such an integral part of, to Harry being who he is, yeah, and and Voldemort and, and everything Dumbledore's else, Dumbledore's whole know. plan, yes, his whole plan mm. is based on the fact that she was, yeah, and I, yeah, we, and her we, mother was supposed to be, you know, mother was twice as famous as she was, yeah, and she had that, she kind of rode that fame or whatever, but she never really did much herself and, until you figure out that she actually is, but quite not the a genius. lot of people, yeah. So yeah. she did one thing in the future that's like pretty much the only important thing she's ever done. She's not a very good seer. I mean, she's a seer, but not very good. Well, in the book, they, they say that, you know, when 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 push comes to shove, she... Yeah, but she's, like, out of it most of the time yeah. and everything. But remember, seers don't really have control over their visions. Yeah. It just comes to them, and then typically they don't remember what they've said. Yeah. And in this case, she doesn't remember what she said. So you'll find out in the future that, yeah, she's very important and she brings in uh, one of the most important aspects of this entire story. Um, but for now, she's just kind of like this crazy, you know, look in the magic ball seer or whatever. But uh, played by Emma Thompson, who is Did fantastic. Great job. Everything that she yeah, does. I've absolutely. never seen anything I don't like of hers. I agree. Um, really good in love, actually. Yeah, one of the very, very most classical, I think, actresses to come out of England, you know, in the last 20, 30 years. Yeah, you know? fiercely independent, strong, all that kind yeah. of stuff. But 
uh, her and Kenneth Branagh actually were married at one point. Really? Yeah, before all this. Huh. And uh, they were an item and stuff, uh, but he had an entanglement. I got into a different kind of entanglement. An entanglement? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> She had an entanglement, or he had an entanglement with Helena Bonham Carter, who we'd also see later in the series as Bellatrix Lestrange. So, yeah, so there's a lot, there's a little bit of drama in the Harry Potter, all this stuff. So, Emma Thompson uh, was married to him. He had an entanglement with Helena Bonham Carter, and him and uh, Emma Thompson separated. Emma Thompson refused to be on on set with now obviously Kenneth Branagh wasn't any of these other movies and she started in the next movie but from that point on and once Helena Bonham Carter got hired as Bellatrix she refused to be on set or in any scenes with Helena Bonham Carter really yeah and I think they would have only been in scenes because Helena Bonham Carter got introduced in part five so there was yeah. only four movies they could have been in scenes with but still very awkward awkward situation with with these oh that's that's jk's these uh, adults. <laughs> ruling you know needing to have only british actors and actresses exactly. you know exactly um anyways they um they find out that uh, he's running away gilderoy lockhart's running away so they use their wands and take away his wand and basically make him go with them to help save her correct and uh, it's it's right around whenever they're going down in the the chamber he steals Ron's wand. He's like, look, I admit that none of these things were my stuff, but I'll tell you something that I'm very good at, and that's memory charms. He's like, you wait, know. Wait, we, we left out a big chunk of this. Why that? Why his wand, like, we didn't really okay. talk about how, how so Ron's as wand. As they were crashing into the Whomping Willow at the very, very beginning of the right. movie, as they're crashing in, Ron's trying to get the car to stop and he keeps slapping the steering wheel. I don't know why that he's not really even saying anything. He's just hitting the steering wheel with his wand expecting probably it to be stop. Doing the same thing to be honest with you. Yeah, and he did it so hard and frantically that the wand ended up literally snapping. the entire movie he doesn't have a wand that works. Yeah. It backfires. What on is everything. going like like you're in a whole second year, a whole year of magic that you're supposed to be learning. You're doing it with something that doesn't even work. Because it's embarrassing. Why, but I mean, why would his parents, like, I know that it's expensive probably to get a wand, but you have to, they, he might as well go home. I mean, I'm there's sure, no way sure Dumbledore could use... repair that wand with like a snap sure, of his finger. Sure, sure. You know, McGonagall could, probably could have done it. There's no way to, to, there's no way that, there's no reason for him to be there. If he's not learning any of the spells, he's obviously not learning any of the spells because it doesn't so work. So is this our plot hole? It has like, to be. Like from the second film, or from the first film where we were like, how did McGonagall not know about Harry's parents? So that was it. Let, yeah. Let's find let's find the 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 hole in every single one of these movies. Is, yeah, just yeah, the one the one time, just have to one like, thing. Our, uh, basically, our Rachel moments. Yes, yes. So. But so our ours for this episode has to be the fact that Ron's went the entire film with a broken wand, and, and we're talking and about months to replace it. This is months that no, this yeah, happened. this is at the end of the school year, so it was a good full school year that he didn't learn anything and so he couldn't have learned anything yeah so this is a part that doesn't this, make any sense this so is a plot hole of this of this uh basically dumbledore movie. refusing to fix his wand and his parents refusing to replace it put him behind and it's probably why ron just sucks so yeah because we can't this. give dumbledore <laughs> that much credit to, to know that you know he was going to do that with ron's wand that being said it had the same thing happened to harry's ron wand in the last book and it broke and everything and they actually make kind of a statement that, like, once it's broke like it was, which is basically how Ron's was broke, you can't fix it. Now, they fix it at the end by using the Elder Wand, the only I, thing that can fix another wand. Yeah. But they I, don't do that in the movie. But Dumbledore has this Elder Wand. I know. That's what I'm saying. But, he but, could fix it if he wanted but to. But this I'm is sure. what I'm saying is that is I think the, the wand lore in these films are extremely confusing, and I think that they kind of... She breaks some rules with the wands. Do you think that Dumbledore is a seer? I mean, it wouldn't make any sense because he had to get this this prophecy for uh, from somebody else. But we literally know he. But but here's the thing: he had the most powerful wand on the planet, and that wand could do anything. Because when they talk about the the Deathly Hollows, they say that wand can do anything. Yeah, and the one thing that Ron's wand was doing was the exact opposite. Of what he meant to do. So yeah. basically, it, it whatever curse he's throwing out, it does it to himself. Yeah. And that's the perfect way to stop Lockhart yeah. from doing what he's doing. It's almost as if 
Dumbledore said, "Well, that's going to come in useful later um, when when you know Dumbledore when Lockhart tries to curse somebody with the uh, the memory charm, it's just going to backfire." So you almost think like Dumbledore just let it go because he knew that Lockhart was going to do that with Ron. An analogy Ron. would be like you know saying you know it's bad that Robin Williams had ADD when he was a kid. You know what I mean? Because look, look where he took it. You yeah. know what I mean? And yeah. then where Ron, you know, had, had a broken wand, but look where it took him, you know, to the point where, you know, Dumbledore knew that Ron was not the most capable right. magician. Right. And right. knew that he he's a Weasley, not a saying that, Weasley. because his older brothers were uh, what's uh, the two. Bill is the one that kind of like a warrior the standing one. Yeah. Charlie's the one that deals with dragons. Right. And the twins are very capable. They're very good at magic. Mo- yeah. Mostly like, you know, jokes and different things. Like, What about I mean, the one that was with Floor? Uh, that was Bill, the older one. But what, would, what what about the other one? There's Percy. Percy, that's so the one. So Percy, he went kind of bad Political. for a whole book and a half or something but not, like that. But they don't show that in the movie. No, they kind of... Well, it, he was... Where he was with Umbridge and everything in Order of the Phoenix, but he yeah. just didn't talk much. But he yeah. was a jackass in that one. But yeah, it's just it's it's a very weird thing that you kind of just have to accept. All right, I guess this go happened. down the rabbit hole on that one. Yeah. So because Ron's thing is broken, he tried to make Malfoy eat slugs and a bunch of different things in the movie. He ended up being the ones that was like vomiting slugs and everything. So it backfires. And when they're going through yeah. to find the chamber. Uh, Lockhart stole the wand from Ron and did the Obliviate, which is the memory charm. So he was going to erase all their memory because you can you can kind of temper that to scale it to how much you want to Obliviate of somebody's memory. Yeah. The fact that he didn't remember anything. Yeah, he was going to erase their entire memory. Yeah. which is well, and, and I think I think you know you you did mention that you know Dumbledore was really kind of trying to teach Harry lessons up until the end, you know, until the very end, until, you know, Deathly Hollows movies, yeah. you know, and books and stuff. Like, he was trying to teach... But I feel like he was trying to teach all three of them lessons the entire time. Maybe. I mean, t- teaching Hermione that just because you know it all and you figure it all out, when you do it by yourself, you get mummified or you get uh, petrified, uh, petrified mm-hmm. you know, because you went... You f- you're you smart enough to figure it out, but instead of bringing other people to help you, you want to take that out on your own. So guess what happened? You were by yourself. You got petrified. Ron, he he tries to be something that he's not. Therefore, you know, in a way, Dumbledore made sure he has a wand and didn't fix his wand to teach him that he's not who he thinks he is. He has to rely on other people yeah. to help him out to fix himself. Yeah. You know, and then Harry, he's you know, trying to teach him how to fulfill his destiny. Right, right. So I feel, I feel like in every single film, and I guarantee you, we can go to every film and find <clears throat> the lesson for all three of them. I in wonder every if that's, single one. I wonder if that says anything to how well he knows Ron and Hermione and Harry, for that matter. Um, and maybe well, they, we see that he can see them at all times for the most part. It, for yeah. the most part, so he's he got to have something. Up to. And I think that there's something in there where you can actually like see through walls like you know he has all these magical yeah. things in his office he might be able to see anywhere he wanted you know the the three or four young teenagers made this thing called the marauders map which we're going to yeah. get into in next movie mm-hmm. but if four young teenagers can make something like that that's that advanced and shows everyone in the castle and what they're doing. I'm sure Dumbledore can do something like that. Yeah. He has his own little Marauders and map or I'm, whatever. And like I said, you know, it, it it's going to say, you know, nobody can sit there and say Hermione knows more than Dumbledore. I wonder if it says that way. that each one of those are like an aspect of Dumbledore's personality. Like could be Hermione. Like Dumbledore can just absorb information in books yeah. and just mm-hmm. can read it once and he knows yeah. the spell or he knows the magic yeah. of it or whatever just like Hermione yep. uh, he's brave like Harry and hey, we'll just and he's goofy go like it. like Ron he can you know, be funny his personality. and goofy yeah. he, so, he, he, you know because if you really look at it Ron's not the most powerful uh, wizard but He's in a, a fierce sense, he's friend. a leader, and he's a fierce friend, and he's and he's a leader yeah. in, in a way. You know, I mean, you get a lot more of that in the book, but he's he's you know he's a leader in the sense that yeah, Harry makes the decisions because even Hermione, like in the Deathly Hollows movie, she says, you know, uh, it's up to you, Harry. You know, you're making the decisions. Dumbledore said, hey, believe in Harry. You know, let Harry, you know, tell you which way to go. He said but, that to Lupin. Uh, 
Kingsley, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, like, Ron's kind of like his bodyguard in that sense. But, you know, again, it is the three aspects of, of Dumbledore's personality, you know, and... and yeah, I think it shows, that, like, we, the, the Weasleys are, are very good friends and very loving, full of compassion and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Hermione has trouble connecting with people. Mm-hmm. So I think you could pull different aspects out of the trio yeah. that Dumbledore understands, right. which is why he thinks that this trio works so well yeah. together, is that, you know, not one amount of power is being put into one personality yeah. or one person yeah. it's being split between the three mm-hmm. and they're figuring out how to do this together and plus you know like harry in, in almost throughout the entire movie until he finally lets go at the end and yeah. lets hap- fate happen he doubts himself the yeah. entire film and you can see it in dumbledore too that he doubts himself regularly he he has a way going and everything's pretty much going to his plan as we see throughout these movies and books but, you know, in a way, he's still doubting himself because he has to rely on three kids to do what obviously he can't. Yeah, I'm sure that there's parts of it. But, yeah, like he doesn't want to take the power into his hands because no. he knows it'll be too much for him. Because then so he becomes. He the, exactly. He gives it to them because he's trying to to, to, to split it or whatever or what yeah. have you. But that that being said, Dumbledore is very confident in himself. I mean, he, many he, times he says stuff like, well, I'm just rather brilliant, you know, yeah. if you're as brilliant as I am. You know, different things like but that. that's Ron right there. Yeah, I mean, Ron like, talks yeah, like but that. I mean, like, Dumbledore, you actually believe it, whereas Ron yeah. is just like, all right, Ron. But, but you know, <laughs> but yeah, that confidence. Yeah, yeah, and he has that confidence in himself, but I think he doesn't take himself seriously because we, we see what happens, you know, later on, and if you read the, all the books, and, you know, you, you can tell what happens with Dumbledore is that, when every time he tried to get power, it just blew up in his face. Yeah. I mean, just every every time that he, he tried to do it, and he, it finally took him probably until he was older that he realized, you know, I mean, you see it a little bit in the Fantastic Beasts. He killed Beast. his sister. Yeah. He we'll killed, just say that. We won't say how or whatever, but we'll say it yeah. straight out. Dumbledore trying to acquire power killed his sister. Right, And right. that's why he doesn't want it anymore. No, he wants to be able to have the children to take over because, you know, just like they say, every generation will be more powerful than yeah. the next. And it gave Grindelwald... Um, the more knowledge and more confidence to go on doing those evil things yeah. that Dumbledore didn't want to do right. anymore. So, right. which we'll get into. But um, so, anyways, they they take him with her. He, he uh, they take them with him. Try to make him uh, help Ron because remember Hermione's petrified for the rest of the movie. In this point, so it's just Ron and, and Hermione and you know, or Ron and Harry. And in the last movie, it was Ron and both Ron and Hermione had to stay behind. And Harry went on his own. Yeah. You know, in this movie, but that, that's what I was saying when I said that he kind of finally had to give in to fate, and and because you know Harry fights it the entire time. Mm-hmm. I mean, he fights the what he needs to do. He knows what he needs to do. He knows how how brutal and bad it's going to get. He just doesn't want his friends to be be fodder. You know, yeah. he he wants to be able to, you know, protect them but also accomplish the mission. You know, but the, they're holding him back. Yeah, they really are. But that's that's kind of what Dumbledore was trying to tell him the entire time that you have to let people handle themselves. You know, yeah. you have to let them. Not, you can't always be protecting them and protect everybody else. I think it's know? the main character slash hero of the story. Like you have to have him face these things alone. Yeah. And, yes. and a lot of the times he is. I think. I mean, even in Order of the Phoenix, they're with him most of the time during the end, but it's just right at the very Term- last struggle, he's right. by himself again. And there's a lot of movies like that. Terminator's yeah. one. You know, Sarah Connor finally had to do it on her own. Yep. You know, yeah, at the, we the very first that one. on that episode, you know, too. That, and, that Kyle was out since he got that bomb blown up right mm-hmm. right under him. Ripley had to do it on her own. Yeah. You know what I mean? In John, both uh, movies. She went off on her own for the daughter in the second one quote unquote daughter or whatever. I can't wait to do those movies yeah. and Bruce Willis had to do it on his own <laughs> it's the only way I mean now the only exception to that of course is part three of Die Hard but you know it, for the most part he had to do it on his own but even then him and Samuel L. Jackson eventually split up during that movie exactly too. so that, that's that's kind of a, a, a script that a lot of these kind of movies follow yeah. you know for the heroes and there's a good variety of things that happen like in the first movie they he went on by himself and he faced the final threat alone in this movie, he went and, but I mean, Ron was with him for a good majority of that, yeah. and Hermione was left out. In the next movie, uh, Ron gets left behind, and Hermione is with him yep. pretty much the whole climax. Um, and then four, he goes on alone again, you know. Mm-hmm. And five, they go to all they all go together, 
and then in six he's all alone again so i mean it kind of goes goes back and, and that's forth. what i was talking about before it shows you the differences when he's by himself yeah and when he has mm-hmm. his people with him but um after uh after lockhart obliviates himself um and he's like who am i and he's just like he's 10 times more funnier like this yeah. I think. oh yeah and uh, it's like he's drunk or it's something. hilarious um, and I'll just say that um, that's really all the effect that, that he has on the story going forward. Um, they do get him out of, you know, they everybody gets to go home yeah. and gets rescued. He does go to St. Mungo's. Mm-hmm. And though we don't see it in the movie, in the book, we see him again in Order of the Phoenix. Yeah. And he's still there, and he's going to be there for the rest of his life. So this is kind of what, this is what, um, in, you know, the price of fame or... yeah you know falseness out there does to you or whatever but um anyways harry goes on alone he opens the uh chamber by himself um he sees Ginny laying on the floor and she's right by the uh the diary and then you see this guy and he says he's tom riddle yeah but you could tell or at least harry can tell that he's not really there but he can see like an image of him Mm -hmm. but he's not physically there so he um, he tells him his name. He writes it up. His name is Tom Marvolo Riddle, and then he he writes it in the air, and the letters change up, and you it changes I up am. to I am Lord Voldemort. Yeah. So you find out that this Tom Riddle guy all along has been Lord Voldemort, and Voldemort's real name is Tom Riddle, and he went to Hogwarts just like everybody else, and he was a student just like everybody else. Yep. But you find more about his time in Hogwarts as we go on. But yes. He was here, and he wrote this diary, and this diary becomes very important in the future. Um, but for right now, just say that there's been some magic that left a piece of himself at that age in that diary. Tom Riddle, what do you mean she won't wake? She's not. She's still alive, but only just. Are you a ghost? A memory, preserved in a diary for 50 years. It was Ginny Weasley who opened the Chamber of Secrets. No, she couldn't. She wouldn't. It was Ginny who set the basilisk on the mudbloods and Filch's cat. Ginny who wrote the threatening messages on the walls. But why? Because I told her to. You'll find I can be very persuasive. Not that she knew what she was doing. She was, shall we say, in a kind of trance. But why did you want to meet me? I knew I had to talk to you. Meet you if I could. So I decided to show you my capture of that brainless oaf, Hagrid, to gain your trust. Hagrid's my friend. And you framed him, didn't you? It was my word against Hagrid's. Only Dumbledore seemed to think he was innocent. But Dumbledore saw right through you. He certainly kept an annoyingly close watch on me after that. I knew it wouldn't be safe to open the chamber again while I was still at school, so I decided to leave behind a diary. Preserving my 16-year-old self in its pages so that one day I would be able to lead another to finish Salazar Slytherin's noble work. Voldemort is my past, present, and future. You're the heir of Slytherin. You're Voldemort. Surely you didn't think I was going to keep my filthy muggle father's name. No. I fashioned myself a new name, a name I knew wizards everywhere would one day fear to speak when I became the greatest sorcerer in the world. Albus Dumbledore is the greatest sorcerer in the world. Dumbledore's been driven out of this castle by the mere memory of me. He'll never be gone. Not as long as those who remain are loyal to him. We remember from the beginning that there was an extra book that was given to Ginny whenever Lucius put the books back in her cauldron. So you find out it was Lucius that actually had that diary and gave it to Ginny so that the chamber would be opened. Yeah. Um, so anyways, Harry uh, finds out that Ginny's... Which the, he, abs- he... Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, Ginny finds out, finds out that Ginny's been the one that's been writing the blood on the walls and that's been hypnotized by Tom Riddle to do all these things and let the basilisk out. And she's been speaking partial tongue through... Uh, Voldemort through Tom Riddle and opening the chamber so that the basilisk can get out but then she comes out of it and realizes what she's done and that's why she threw the diary in the toilet one time and that's when Harry found it yeah. what were you going to say well it's kind of weird that he kind of takes over a a, uh, a pure blood you know what I mean like yeah. he, he doesn't he doesn't really 
like it might have been just a lucius thing like he didn't have any choice because jenny was just the one that started writing in it and then she yeah. started talking with him yeah i think that lucius gave it to jenny thinking that she'd be the most vulnerable because mm-hmm. she was a first year student here she was a weasley who he looked at as inferior so he just figured that she would be vulnerable to be taken over like that yeah because he knew what that was yeah or like he at least he knew it was a diary that had some voldemort stuff i don't think he knew what it actually was that yeah. we find out later um which we'll talk about more but so anyways uh you see the snake come out the basilisk it starts chasing harry down but uh harry says something good about dumbledore and so out of nowhere fox the phoenix comes now that door is closed so there's got to be a way to get out of there yeah. or at least small animals to be getting in and that's maybe what the basilisk has been feeding on well or matt we're, we're in a magic school <laughs> with a creature that that's doesn't true. exist and a hat that just and pulls a sword out of yeah so it's, is it really that far-fetched? Yeah, so and you find out when he was in the office that uh, Dumbledore tells Harry, conveniently, that they're capable of carrying very heavy loads, uh, their tears have healing capabilities, and they come when somebody's loyal to a Dumbledore, they just come to Dumbledore's yeah. when they're in need or whatever. So um, the fo- uh, fox comes down, drops the hat, there's nothing in the hat, but Harry sees something kind of shining in it or whatever. And Voldemort's are like, really? This your protector brings you this a hat, or whatever. And uh, so Harry starts running, and the bird, the phoenix, pecks out the bird's eyes because remember he can't look at the basilisk; he'll either be petrified or killed. Yeah, killed if he looks straight at it. So now that the bird's pecked out its eyes, it can't it can't kill anybody, and it can't freeze anybody with its eyes anymore. It can still eat them. Yeah, well, and it's got poison fangs. Exactly, but there's no magic in it anymore where it's yeah. like a Medusa thing and it turns you into stone or, yeah. or whatever. So um, he runs around, it's chasing him and all that kind of stuff. Um, he finds the sword inside the hat, and because he was, like, like I said, he was loyal to Dumbledore, that's why the bird came. But if anybody is in a situation where they're being brave, and he was, he knew he was about to give his life, but he wanted to make sure that uh, Ginny survived. So in that moment, because he was being brave like that, and that's one of the mm-hmm. hallmark traits of a Gryffindor, right. suddenly the sword of Gryffindor appeared in the hat. And you find out later that it only appears to a Gryffindor in need. Yeah. So, so you had to have been a Gryffindor, and you had to have been somebody in need that's being heroic. And that's what that's what was happening to Harry. Um, so he pulled that out of the hat. Not the first time we see that sword pulled out of a hat. We'll come back to that in the very last yep. movie. And it's a completely different character that does it. Somebody that we mentioned in the last episode was kind of important. Um, so he pulls the sword out. He starts climbing the statue and stabs the the uh, the basilisk and kills it, but not while at the same time. The, the as he's stabbing inside the mouth and the head or whatever, mm-hmm. the, basilisk, the basilisk actually punctures the skin with a tooth mm-hmm. and everything. So Harry's about to die, um, but um, Harry goes down to Jenny and uh, he's like, you know, I'm dying and everything. And uh, the Tom I'm Riddle, dying. he's pissed that the snake is dying, the basilisk is dying, but he knows Harry's about to be dead and he's about to come alive again. I don't know if it gives him his body back or if he then gets reincarnated in Ginny's body. So he's still walking around like head. a girl. It could be on the back, on of, back of her head. head. <laughs> Jeez, maybe he's using that same spell or whatever. Um, going to go after the stone again, look for that <laughs> mirror. <imagine> her wearing, <laughs> why are you wearing that thing around your head? Uh I don't know, and she's just like walking like this with her head back. I just, just had this little, know. just had this little growth. And yeah, Baltimore's like, all this hair is really annoying. <laughs> right now. Um, so, anyways, um, the phoenix come and cries tears on Harry. H- on Harry's arm, which obviously heals him. And he takes the fang, one of the fangs that he's got, uh, that was in his hand or whatever. And why did he do this? Why did he stab the journal? What, what sense does that make? We know what it does now, but if you're thinking about how do I get rid of this thing, would you stab the journal with a tooth? No, I'm pretty sure I'd grab the uh, sword of the Gryffindor and stab it. But why would you even stab the book? Well, I, I, there was my, maybe maybe we missed it, but maybe there was some lore about the fangs. Well, we I know about the fangs because the fangs have basilisk venom, and basilisk venom is one of the only things that can destroy a... Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we can't mention that right now. So well, maybe I mean because he, he, he had to destroy it. He knew he had to destroy. We're talking it. about Harry's 
level of knowledge right now. Why right, right. would he well, think of stabbing the book? Because he knows that it's the source of Voldemort that he has to somehow source get rid of, of that the book. Tom Riddle. Right, right, and and I mean, he didn't have a fire. He didn't, he, you know, he couldn't throw it in the water. You know, he he had to find something to hurt it, yeah. the book, because it's almost alive. When he started to raise up the tooth, then Tom Riddle's like, "What are you doing? No, don't do that." I mean, that's like an obvious giveaway, Obviously, right? Yeah. So you know you're on the right track. <laughs> He's like, "Huh? Huh? huh? <laughs> I'm huh? gonna stab it. Oh, oh no! I'm gonna stab it. Oh, I'm gonna stab it. Hey, look over there. Oh. Tom Riddle keeps going. <laughs> so anyways, he stabs it, and it starts bleeding ink. And, um, and of course, every piercing that he's given the book is like a hole in the t- Tom Riddle image that's there. And yeah. Anyways, it makes him go away and destroys the book. And when I say destroy the book, you'll understand what I mean when I get to the, when we get to the Death Correct. of the Hallows. Um, so anyways, he destroys the journal, and suddenly Jenny wakes up. She's feeling better again. She's like, I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. Tom Riddle made me do it. He's like, yeah, I got you. You're good, girl. And uh, he's like, you and me are going to be good later on. Yeah, and he gave me candy. <laughs> he rolled up in a white van and gave me some candy. So he, he tells her, uh, but he tells her to go and find Ron. But this is actually when the Phoenix Tears things happen. He heals yeah. him after that or whatever. But And then Fox carries Ron, Hermione, Gilderoy, and uh, Harry out of there. Yeah. And a callback to the it can carry immense weights Wait, and yeah. all that kind of stuff. So they carry him out of there, and um, you know when they get back, uh, Dumbledore's like just you know amazed. Oh, you did good again, and he you know he even says it's not our ability to sh- it's not our ability that shows who we really are. It's our choices, because Harry has the ability to be powerful. That ability comes from Voldemort, though. Yeah. You know, he's not a powerful wizard. His parents were good wizards and witches, but they weren't powerful. Not anywhere close to Voldemort. Harry is, but only because of that little piece of, at of the his same time, power that got attached to him. At the same time, though, he does become an aura. Aura. Yeah, but they're, they're like the most powerful of all the wizards and witches. Yeah, but he's not know. an aura the whole time. I mean, I think yeah, Ron even starts being an aura with him too, but then he ends up going and running the joke shop with uh, George. Yeah. You know, and uh, Hermione's doing her own thing or whatever. But I don't know. It's it's. I, th- I thought the line was good when yeah. Dumbledore says, it's not our ability to show who we really are because that's Voldemort. Mm-hmm. That's showing his ability. That's yeah. who he is. That's yeah. all he's got going for him. Uh, but it's our choices. And so this whole thing, the first two movies we've been talking about, it's about Dumbledore testing Harry's choices. Yeah. You know, now we're going to, starting in book three, we're going to start getting into the real battle of what's going on. We get a lot of information that we need next movie, and then Goblet of Fire really sets it off. Yeah. And we're getting into the real battle. But this first two movies, I believe, was Dumbledore getting a good sense of who Harry was while also taking care of a couple problems yeah. that need to be taken care of. But... Um, <clears throat> So, anyways, um, uh, Lucius basically almost Avada Kedavra's <laughs> Harry. Oh, I know. So, I mean, this is obviously not in the book, but uh, um, Isaac, Jason Isaacs was reading the book at the time to try to figure out the character, and it was either him or some stagehand that he asked, like, here, give me a spell or something. What's a spell? And he remembered Avada Kedavra being part of the book somewhere. He couldn't remember which book, though. Yeah. And didn't know what it did. So he's like, okay, that sounds like, oh, blah, blah. you know, so what happens is uh, Harry tricks Lucius into giving Dobby a sock, mm-hmm. which in the magical world, if you give a house elf any kind of piece of clothing, no matter how or what, it signifies you releasing them from servitude and they mm-hmm. get to become their own person. So Or slavery. Let's just go with slavery because that's definitely what it exactly. is. Exactly. Dobby! Master has given Dobby a sock. What? I didn't... Master has presented Dobby with clothes. Dobby is free. You lost me, my servant! You shall not harm Harry Potter! So Harry frees Dobby, and Dobby knows that Harry did it. Yeah. But he's just like, Master's given Dobby a sock. Dobby is free. And so that pisses Lucius off. And he's going to Avada Kedavra Harry over losing his house elf. 
Like, yeah. that was a Jason Isaac thing. I'm surprised the director left it in instead of going, hey, JK, is that okay that we said that? Because yeah. you know she was around for yeah. a lot of this. And so you'd think somebody would have been like, hey, he's doing this Avada Kedavra thing. Is that cool? And she would have been like, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, so anyways, he uh, he gets Dobby freed and everything. And so Dobby is like, oh, I'm going to love you for the rest of my life. Yeah. Anything you ever need. Harry Potter free Dobby. How can Dobby ever repay him? Just promise me something. Anything, sir. Never try to save my life again. No, but he didn't have to do that. Yeah. But, you know, he saw an opportunity for him to... <laughs> Plus, he didn't want him to keep messing with him Yeah, either. that's true. He's like... And I think that's what he said. He's like... Uh, something like, please don't ever try to help me again. No, please don't ever try to save my life. Yeah, yeah. Don't ever try to save my life again. He's like... Uh-huh. But um, so anyways, they're all eating <laughs> and, uh, you know, Ginny or Hermione comes back from the the hospital and she's doing good. And there's like an awkward little she hugs Harry and then goes to hug Ron and, and then kind of steps hands. back. So that's like the first indication you get that there's something funky going between Ron and Hermione. Mm -hmm. Whether you like it or not, I know that there's a lot of people that ship Harry and Hermione and a lot of people that ship Ron and Hermione. Yeah. Um, we can get into some of that later. That'll be some good content for us to talk about in later episodes or whatever. But um, she's very weird talking about him. But all the victims have been healed thanks to Madam Sprout. And uh, in walks uh, Hagrid, yep. who gets the final warm, awesome, epic, you know, uh, closing or whatever when he comes into the Great Hall and he thanks Ron and Hermione for helping him out because I would have been you know where. And he, you mm -hmm. could tell that was an awful place, Azkaban. And everybody starts clapping for him for some reason. Yeah. I think that, that what they're clapping for is because Hagrid has had this this rumor about him, this stigma about him, that he did this awful thing. Yeah. And everybody kind of just forgave it because they're kind of like, well, maybe he probably didn't do it because we trust Dumbledore and Dumbledore trusts him. Yeah. And plus, Hagrid is actually a pretty skilled wizard. I mean, all, all in all. Intents and purposes. I mean, he I mean, knows a lot about magical creatures, that's for sure. Well, yeah, but I mean, he, he does anybody. fight with his wand quite often. I mean, and nobody bats an eye. You he know? probably knows as much, well, almost as much as Newt's commander does oh, about sure. magical creatures and everything. Oh, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, there's always been kind of a suspicion about Harry or about Hagrid, of, not just at the school, but of the whole wizarding world. Mm -hmm. Did he do this or not? Yeah. Can a giant be trusted? Whatever. Yeah. But um, I think that that clapping at the end, because all the student, all the teachers stood up and started clapping too. And it was like, finally, people have caught up to where Dumbledore has been this whole time and yeah. realized it wasn't Hagrid. It was Tom Riddle yeah. that did that and should have been obvious to people back then. Yeah. But a lot of people still don't know that Tom Riddle was Voldemort. Right. So anyways, it comes down to this thing where everybody's happy that Hagrid's won back and two, that his name has been cleared after all these years. Yeah. People know that he wasn't the one that did it. So, and then we end with zooming out of the castle and uh, it's very, it's uh, another strange ending that doesn't really end at the end of the year. Yeah. You know, it ends before the end of the yeah. year or whatever, but. I'm not, I'm not really going home. Not, really. Really. not really. Not really. Not really. So, and that's our movie. And uh, next time we talk about Harry Potter, we'll be talking with Kaylee, and we'll be talking about werewolves and animagus and blowing up your aunt and... Um, one of the most important parts. Hagrid gets a new job in the next one. There's time travel. And Patronuses. And a new Dumbledore and Patronuses. So we get to so we get to really start unfolding the Harry Potter universe in the next movie. So, um, But yeah, that'll be it. Um, we've been a little busy with some stuff lately, so it's been hard for us to get episodes out. Um, Drew's about to have a child as well. Yes. Uh, a newborn baby. And so um, we're going to still try to get these out when we can, um, but uh, they might be a little spotty over the next few weeks. Um, just trying to get into the studio when we can, but don't worry. We're not slowing down or anything. We just got to slow down for a bit and, uh, we'll pick it back up here in just a little bit and really start pumping them out again. So, uh, but hope you guys enjoyed this Harry Potter last week's Harry Potter. Look forward to, um, it's not going to be next week, but it'll be probably the weekend or the week after that, that we do, um, uh, prisoner of Azkaban. Uh, but we're going to still try to do some other movies too. So we get that done. We'll get prisoner done. But um, how did you like this movie? 
I loved it. I love all these movies, but this one... Watching it again, was it any... Because I think for a while there, we didn't like Chambers either. No, I like Chambers one. just because you get a little... You, you get your real, real introduction to Voldemort. And it's been established. Like, the world's been established now. Yeah. And, like, like, the whole time, even up until the very end, we we're still establishing things. Now, yeah. you know, through each one of these stories, we're still going to be establishing things. But there's less of it. There's more of... Okay, now we're in this world. Now let's, now let's spice the world up. Yeah. You know, that type of thing. So... I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, still better than Deathly Hallows Part 1 for me, and probably st- it's still better than Sorcerer's Stone for me. Um, yeah. This one and the rest above is great movies. So. Uh, if you guys want to get a hold of us, we're on all social media at The Post Credit Podcast, except for Twitter, we're at The Post Credit. Our email address is ThePostCreditPodcast at gmail.com. We have a website. It's www.ThePostCreditPodcast.com, and we're on YouTube. Uh, we appreciate you guys listening, and we'll see you next time. And throw me a wand.